the imagination is dangerous because it creates a radical form of autonomy. If people can imagine that the world could be a different way, that gives them freedom to choose, which means that they may not choose the same path and values as their parents. So I would find these, these uh, evangelical tracts about Dungeons and Dragons, and they would say things like, the world as it currently exists is exactly the way that God wants it to be. And so if you imagine things being differently, you are defying God. Welcome. You know, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm a professor of religious studies at Texas State University, and I teach courses on world religion. Uh, and I teach courses that are designed to get butts in seats. So I teach a course called Cults of New Religious Movements. Uh, I teach a course on exorcism. Uh, and I find that these are ways to sort of uh, lure students into taking a religious studies class who maybe wouldn't otherwise. So did you get interested in emergent religions first? What was the first thing that interested you? Because you have such a varied kind of uh, group of things you're interested in. Yeah, so religious studies is a field. It's not really a discipline. And there isn't a definition of what religion is. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a lot of things that potentially fall under the, the field of religious studies. And the things that I were drawn to uh, were the things that were sort of understudied and kind of on the, the fringes. What is crypto, cryptozoology? Sure, so cryptozoology is a field of research that's interested in discovering unknown animals. Uh, and it's not an accepted science. So you can't go to Texas State University and find a professor of cryptozoology. It's mostly being done uh, by amateurs. And the cryptozoologists would say, we discover new species every day, which is true. Right, but we're mostly talking about beetles and other forms of invertebrates. The types of animals that cryptozoologists tend to be most interested in are megafauna, right? So big animals, and especially things like the Loch Ness monster, Bigfoot, uh, the Yeti, uh, and, and basically taking legends and folklore and hypothesizing there could be a real biological animal out there uh, uh, corresponding to this. And there are a few things that the cryptozoologists claim. Uh, as winds. So uh, orangutans for a, for a while, uh, Westerners said, this is probably just a story about ogres or something that these, these local people are telling. Well, it turned out orangutans are, are real. Nice. Uh, gi giant pandas, uh, the coelacanth, a, a fish thought to be uh, yeah. extinct. The critics of cryptozoology would say, you claim to find monsters. These are not monsters. The coelacanth is a fish. The orangutan is a, is a primate. These are yeah. normal animals. But the cryptozoologists would respond, but these were monsters before mm -hmm. someone discovered them, right? Before someone proved they were real. You know, the Mothman, you know, how do you prove it or not prove it? I mean, it's been out there a long time at this point, no? That's right. So the, the Mothman sightings uh, begin in 1966 uh, with a group mm -hmm. of teenagers. So all we really have is eyewitnesses and you either believe them or you don't. We don't have a photo of, of Mothman. Do you have a descriptor of Mothman? What is the descriptor? Yeah, so originally what people were seeing sounded more like a large bird, um, sort of a, an enormous uh, bipedal bird-like creature. And it, it later came to be called the Mothman uh, because of a Batman villain called the Killer Moth. Batman was very popular in the 1960s. And that name sort of stuck and that name changed the art. So now when you see images of Mothman, it has wings like a moth. That's not originally what people reported seeing. The other thing that they all said was it had these enormous glowing red eyes. Right. Uh, and, and that there was uh, a kind of psychological reaction to being near it, that it caused tremendous uh, fear. And in this first sighting, these teenagers were in a rural area outside of town called the TNT area. It had been a munitions plant during World War II. And by the 60s, it was where teenagers went to sort of joyride and, and neck. Yeah. And it, it chased them all the way back to town and finally uh, broke away as it, got, as it got to the lights of the city. But it was supposedly keeping up with their car as it flew, and right. they were going, you know, near 100 miles an hour. Uh, they filed a police report as soon as they got back to town. So that's the one unusual detail. And, and the Mothman Museum in Point Pleasant uh, now has that police report, so you can actually go and, and look at it. Uh, but that's not evidence, right? That's just right. sort of an, an extra detail to this eyewitness account. But I also want to just point out 1966. We could be smoking pot, we could be dropping acid. You know, I mean, I, I want to play the devil's advocate. 
devil's advocate talking to you, just to understand like, how does this Mothman also show up? Maybe so we can start to see, okay, that's these kids. Well, where else does Mothman show up? Right. So in the, the year after that sighting, there were about a hundred different sightings of this creature. And so we can speculate about what they were actually seeing. Were they seeing the same thing? Were some of these people sort of primed by the idea that there's a flying humanoid out there and they saw something else? Uh, and then other sort of similar sightings around the world came to be interpreted as the, the Mothman. There were sightings in 2019 in Chicago uh, and people began saying this is the Mothman. And then sort of retroactively, researchers like John Keel, who kind of made the Mothman famous, found other accounts of weird flying humanoids throughout history and said, I think that this is the same thing. And he actually homed in on the legend of the Garuda. The Garuda is a mythological bird uh, from India. And, you know, right. the, the Hindu gods fly around riding on the Garuda and things like that. And so he speculated there was some sort of actual phenomenon here uh, that appears in world religion and folklore, and then also in these, these sightings of monsters in the 20th century. What are dangerous games? Dangerous Games is a, a book that I wrote uh, about uh, role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons, and specifically the panic over Dungeons and Dragons that happened in the 1980s. And I grew up playing this game in Texas, where uh, the conservative Christianity is a big cultural force. And when I got a, a PhD in the sociological study of religion, uh, I felt like I could finally articulate something which I first sensed in childhood, which was simply why is a children's game the thing that these conservative Christians are so upset about? With all of the different uh, moral and, and social issues of the day, what is it uh, about uh, children playing a, a game of imagination? So my book, Dangerous Games, is sort of telling the history of that, uh, that episode in American religious culture, and then trying to explain it, right? Trying to answer this question of what is so dangerous about uh, something like Dungeons and Dragons? And what is so dangerous about that? Like, what is it in one line? I mean, or, well, I'll read the book, but... What is it? I, well, first of all, most of the people were just, their pastor said, this is a very dangerous game that will make your children commit suicide. If someone I trusted said that to me, I would probably just uh, accept it. But, but the people driving the panic, I think on some level, they had sort of two concerns that they weren't actually saying out loud. One was that uh, there was a realization that if you were trying to sort of win a culture war and control the minds and hearts of uh, the next generation, the imagination is dangerous because it creates a radical form of autonomy. Mm -hmm. right? If people can imagine that the world could be a different way, that gives them freedom to choose, which means that they may not choose the same path and values as their parents. Mm -hmm. So I would find these, these uh, evangelical tracts about Dungeons and Dragons, and they would say things like, the world as it currently exists is exactly the way that God wants it to be. And so if you imagine things being differently, you were defying God. So right. fire engines are red because that's God's favorite color for fire engines to be. And if you imagine the very idea of a blue fire engine, that is telling God your creation is not good enough. Right. And, and, and as a, uh, someone who studies religion historically, I found this very odd because traditionally Christianity has seen the imagination as something that is sacred. Uh, the imagination is a way through which people can know God. So it was very odd to find this, these claims that the imagination is demonic and, and blasphemous. The other thing that I think was driving this was the fear that their religious worldview could actually be more like a role-playing game, a game of fantasy, mm -hmm. uh, than, than something which is sort of taken for granted as uh, really real. So one of the concerns was that Dungeons and Dragons has fantasy worlds with fantasy religions. And some people were saying children are worshiping these pagan gods they learn about in these books. And there was a woman who had an organization called Bothered About Dungeons and Dragons, or BAD <laughs> for short. And a reporter said, why do you assume that children don't know the difference between fantasy and reality? Why do you think they would actually practice these fantasy religions? And she said, well, the children believe in God. And they only know about God from the Bible. Right. And I think what that comment kind of betrayed is, uh, uh, you know, religion is sort of a, a social reality. In addition right. to whatever else it is, it's a social reality that is fueled by all of us participating in it and accepting it as real. And so the idea that a, a fantasy game like this uh, could, could seem real kind of led to the, the uncomfortable uh, uh, suspicion right? That the sort of everything you've built your life around could also be a kind of collective fantasy. Is, is that where you got the spark? And is that the connection between religion 
uh, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and cryptozoology? Is it all sort of just an extension of the same thing that you learned at a particular time? I mean, to be totally honest, I think the main connection here might just be nerdiness. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, people who play Dungeons and Dragons and people who are interested in talking about Bigfoot and Mothman, uh, you know, are probably not going to make the football team or they're less likely to, right? <laughs> right? Which here in Central Texas, making the football team yeah, uh, is, is a big deal. Uh, but of course, it's right there in the name, Dungeons and Dragons. This is about monsters, right? This is right. about sort of escaping the boringness of the ordinary world and encountering things that are fantastic and frightening and, and amazing. And, and I actually think that at its best, that's that's something that religious studies does as, as well. Now, what about spirit possession? Is that a different thing? Or is that the, you know, what, how does that differ from that? Yeah, so spirit possession is, is another area that I, that I research. I mentioned my class on exorcism. Mm -hmm. So anthropologists have noticed that almost every human culture on earth has a tradition of spirit possession, that sometimes mm -hmm. you are not yourself. Mm -hmm. And in the Western culture, we think of possession by demons, and it's something mm -hmm. very dangerous and scary, and it has to be dealt with with exorcism. Uh, in other cultures, possession can be more ambiguous or more neutral. It can also mm -hmm. be positive. So for example, a shaman uh, might be possessed by spirits and then have the ability to heal people or give information that the people could use. Now, an anthropologist might look at something like Veronica Lucan going into a trance state yep. or Pentecostals who are speaking in tongues and are admittedly not in control of their actions. And Pentecostals will even say, well, I was filled with the Holy Spirit. But if we say, well, that's spirit possession, a spirit literally went in you and made you do these things, they would say, right. no, 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 possession's bad. What I do is, right. is, is different. But anthropologically, they're, they're very similar. And anthropologists are sort of agnostic about what's actually happening to these mm -hmm. people. Uh, there are a lot of ethical restrictions about going into a very intense religious situation and trying to collect uh, uh, data on people. So mm -hmm. we don't really know very much. We have done some brain scans of Pentecostals when they speak in tongues. Yeah. And it does appear that actually something significant is happening neurologically really? mm. uh, in their brains, which suggests at least that this is a real phenomenon and they are not just sort of constant or, or consciously choosing to speak gibberish. Is there something to do also with um, not epilepsy, but there are the, you know, are there commonalities in the, in, that's one question I have for you. And also, the wanting something so badly, you know, you know, mind over matter <laughs> or mind over body, you're wanting something so desperately to happen. Are they, do they ever study, you know, what is the commonality amongst all these people that have these visions? And usually they are coming out of extreme religiosity or something, right? It's, it's some kind of a, something to do with that. Is there a commonality there? between the person who's thinking about the Mothman and, and somebody who's being possessed and somebody who's just praying, you know? Right. Right. Well, so John Keel, you know, said very early on that the things that these eyewitnesses are reporting are impossible, right? A six foot tall figure, no matter how big its wings are, cannot just take off, right, mm -hmm. from the side of the road. So he said, assuming that they're not lying, something must be really going on. And, and, and he kind of hypothesized that they were entering sort of trance states and things like this, which is mm -hmm. an interesting uh, idea that they were sort of really experiencing these things, but not physically as a kind of hallucination. So there's potentially a, a, a connection uh, there. It's also possible that not all these people are experiencing the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so some people who experience fear possession could be having what in our culture we would classify as mental illness, mm -hmm. right? a dissociative disorder. The anthropologist I am Lewis uh, wrote a book on this, and he said, you know, it's really interesting that cultures of the tradition of shamanism do not have mentally ill people. Mm -hmm. They don't need to institutionalize anyone, right? So right. if one member of the tribe is constantly hearing voices and things, well, that person might not be the best hunter-gatherer. Mm -hmm. They may not be able right. to help the tribe much that way. However, their differences can be repurposed. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you take them to a shaman and they train under the shaman and then they uh, become an asset to the community instead of right. uh, a, a love problem. That. that is a beautiful idea, by the way. Yeah, we well, we'd have to do that with an awful lot of people in America to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think we have enough shamans to do it. You know what I mean? Shamans. Um, um, but, you know, do you need a, um, and what role does the devil play you know, like, uh, you know, they, they always need some force. People need a force to, to work against them. I mean, is the Mothman and, and some of these monsters the same thing as role the devil plays in, in, the, in the Bible? 
Well, it's, it's interesting because historians of the devil have noticed the devil isn't really in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, when, the old te when the devil shows up in the, the book of Job, uh, he just walks into heaven and talks to God. And God says, oh, hey, how are, how are you right. doing? Uh, the devil right. in the book of Job is totally loyal to God. He just doesn't like people very much. That's right. a very different character from a fallen angel, which mm -hmm. we see in, in the New Testament. And, and so one interpretation of this is in the Old Testament, there is no need for a devil because God is so mean. Right. <laughs> right? right. When bad things happen to you in the Old Testament, it's, it's because God did it. In fact, mm -hmm. when people get possessed in the Old Testament, it is with an evil spirit of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Right. So demons are not possessing people like Saul. Uh, demons are not hardening the Pharaoh's heart. God is doing this. But by the New Testament, God is now loving, which means mm -hmm. we need to have some other way to explain all the bad stuff that happens to people. Uh, we also know that by this time period, uh, Israel had been exposed to ideas from Persia and Zoroastrianism, mm -hmm. which is a religion where traditionally there is a, a force of good and also a, a, a force of evil. Mm -hmm. So the devil becomes an important way of thinking about all sorts of misfortune uh, and, and why bad things happen in Christian tradition. I think that demons often begin very much the way that the Mothman began in Point Pleasant of being a very sort of ambiguous, neutral figure that's kind of tied to the landscape and mm -hmm. could be good or bad. But, but really, the important thing is that you kind of know how to deal with the local spirits that live in your community. And then some religious authority will come in and say, no, 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 this is a demon, right? And, and not only do I know it's a demon, but it's you know, part of this category of demons, which which falls into my sort of demonology of, of right. my religion. Uh, I actually began to see that happening. So I, I, I did. So you uh, got out of there real quick. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, as a religious studies scholar, I, I pride myself on being able to, to get along with pretty much anybody. Right. Uh, but there were people who began saying Mothman is a demon, right? It's mm -hmm. a demon just as described in, in the Bible. Uh, interestingly, Linda Scarberry, who was one of the four original witnesses, Mm -hmm. initially said Mothman was the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life. By the end of her life, though, she began sort of pushing back against this notion that it's a demon and a monster. And she said, mm -hmm. well, I think it was misunderstood. I think it was lost, whatever mm -hmm. it was. And so it goes from being something really scary and dangerous to being polarized and either being something really nice and misunderstood right. or being a, a demon in the biblical tradition. Now, where do vampires fit in that, that hierarchy? Well, you know, vampires are another thing that I've, I've studied, and vampires, the, the origins of them are sort of known to nobody. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the word vampire appears for the first time in the 1700s, and it's describing a group of human merchants, not a, not a monster. So it's like, you believe these guys, they're like, they're like vampires coming right. in and taking all our money. Yeah. Uh, so, so it has, it's not a word in another language. So our word vampire appears to combine uh, uh, creatures that are found in the mythologies of uh, uh, Bulgaria in Eastern Europe is sort yeah. of the epicenter of this, and then ideas from Germany and Greece and Russia, and this is a part of the world where all these cultures have kind of mixed together, and so the origins of the vampire appear to be pre-Christian, mm. uh, but it has become Christianized uh, uh, over time, and this is why vampires, you know, don't go into churches and are repelled by crosses and, right. and things like this. It's a metaphor, then. The, the word is actually a metaphor for what a person could do to you, leech the life out of you, suck the blood out of you, take your money, right? So we've, certain, the, we've certainly all known some people like that, you know yeah, what I mean? But I mean, it, so do you think, I mean, I'm just curious, do you th the origin of that, is it more that and then it morphs into, then it becomes a demonized and it becomes religious? Like how, how does religion hijack it as a concept or not? Right. So again, you know, when we kind of go back to the folklore, it's not clear if we're always talking about the same thing. So we have entities that sort of suck out the life or the vitality of, of the land. And in some cases, this appears to be a way of explaining uh, illness, right? So mm -hmm. why? Are, so so if, if, a, if an illness strikes a, a village and your family member dies, and then after that you get sick, you can imagine saying, well, your dead family member is actually sucking your life force off uh, from right. beyond the grave. So in some cases, it could be a way of sort of uh, explaining things. Uh, in, in those mythologies, the vampire is not always a, a risen corpse. Sometimes it's uh, a, more of like a, a mist or even sort of this weird kind of ball of blood that rolls around and sucks up ah. a, a, a material. Uh, so, but the common thing does seem to be it feeds off of 
what you need to be healthy and, and, and happy, right? And so people like Karl Marx uh, use the word vampire, right? right. To, to just as a critique of, of, of capitalism. You got these students, they're coming in, they have no idea what they're getting into. So they sit down, you know, what are they thinking at the end of the first class? Or, you know, are they just their heads spinning? You know, what are they, what's going on with them? Because they think they're just going for a laugh and then all of a sudden you're, you're hitting them with all this stuff. Right. Well, you know, I worry a lot about my students being bored. <laughs> and so I teach classes about vampires and cults and exorcism. Right. You know, I'm hoping they're at least not bored. Um, there are a lot of assumptions that, that students bring to those kinds of classes. So I do have to do a lot to push back against that, uh, especially in my class on cults, right? right. Because a big, a big assumption of my field of new religious movements is that, for example, brainwashing, as it is commonly described, is not a real phenomenon, mm -hmm. right? In other words, that there are not sort of secret techniques that you can use mm -hmm. to control people's decisions. You can certainly right. do all sorts of things to incentivize them to make a decision that you want to make, but you, you can't do mind control. You can't do the right. Manchurian candidate. And a lot of my students uh, are, are, you know, they watch lots of Netflix documentaries. Uh, a lot of them got really interested in the recent scandal about Nexium, which was mm -hmm. this group that was blackmailing women and branding them. And yeah. so it can be very hard to convince them that brainwashing is not the best way of explaining uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, that type of phenomena. And sometimes they'll, it'll, this will even get uh, emotional, right? And they'll yeah. say, you know, so, so you're saying that what Nexium is doing is okay? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Saying, no, of course I'm not saying that. I'm just yeah. saying that uh, we need to think more strategically about what's really going on and right. how they get that kind of compliance from the people that they are abusing. It's amazing that you've been studying this stuff. It's like, you know, thank you so much for sharing it with us. It's fantastic, yeah. Joseph. It's wonderful. Yeah. And so just, I want to take your class on that. And, yeah. gonna, and there's a whole other conversation for another time just around really getting to religion and religion hijacking politics, which I know you also write about and think about a lot. There's so much food for thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you very thank much, you so Joseph. Much. This was fantastic. Okay. Yeah. You as well. This has been really fun. Okay. Bye-bye.